Assalamu alaikum, my respected brothers and sisters, and welcome to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad. In our last episode, we spoke at length about the Prophet's ancestors, going all the way back to, uh, to Ibrahim, and we even spoke about the different categories of Arabs. And we mentioned that the Prophet hails from the uh, the Adnani Arabs. He is an Arabized Arab from the line of Ismail. And among the Prophet's ancestors, there are a number of them uh, who occupy uh, a special, they, they, they possess a special type of distinction. Um, of course, we mentioned that uh, at least in the Shia tradition, according to Alam al-Majlisi, all of the Prophet's forefathers were either prophets or they were successors of prophets. Now, there are other Shia scholars who believe that at the very least, uh, we know that they were all monotheists. They were believers in, uh, in one God and, uh, and they followed uh, the Abrahamic tradition. So among the Prophet's ancestors, there are a few of them who, who really deserve uh, some uh, extra discussion. We mentioned in our last episode the Prophet's great-grandfather, whose name was Amr, but he was known as Hashim, which literally means the, the breaker of bread. Now, all of the clans within the massive tribe of Quraysh, because you know, Quraysh is a is a is a tribe. It's a super tribe, consisting of of over ten thousand members, and then within the tribe you have uh, clans. So Quraysh recognized Hashim's extraordinary leadership in reviving the economic primacy of Mecca, as we indicated earlier. Mecca, the people of Mecca and the surrounding areas, they were on the brink of starvation. And it was Hashim who establishes the summer and winter trading routes to Syria and Yemen. And therefore, you find that Hashim was able to transform Mecca from a very primitive, underdeveloped, Bedouin community into a commercial business hub. So he he builds the the infrastructure for these trading routes. Now, what is what did he actually do? What does it mean when we say that Hashim uh, built uh, the infrastructure for these two uh, important annual uh, trading expeditions? Historians say that Hashim traveled to the the Byzantine emperor, and he petitioned for a writ of passage, passage for the caravans of Quraysh, because as you can imagine, it was not safe for people to travel uh, through the open uh, desert. Uh, you, would, uh, you would be putting yourself in danger. You would be vulnerable to highway robbers. So one of the things that Hashim does is that he goes and he lobbies the, the Byzantine emperor to issue protection, to provide protection to the caravans of Quraysh. And, and what he does in addition to this, he approaches all of the, the chiefs of the tribes uh, throughout the region and procures a pledge from them to protect uh, the people who uh, who travel through the desert, and this again goes to show how how serious the Arabs took a pledge and an oath. So he 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 petitions the the Byzantine emperor to provide protection to the caravans uh, of Quraysh, and it, he promises. Uh, and of course, there was an economic advantage to uh, to the emperor because uh, you know some of the best leather in that region uh, came. From, uh, from the Arab lands. So it was economically advantageous for both of them. You know, he, he, he promised to provide uh, some, some of the, the goods that were manufactured in Arabia in exchange for, for that protection. 
And then you see that Hashem goes to the heads of uh, the tribes in the in that region, and uh, he approaches every tribal head on the route from Mecca to the Levant, and he he procured their pledge to allow safe passage. And this effort of uh, of Hashem is actually enshrined in the Quran in Surah Quraysh, where Allah says, "Li Quraysh." So the Quran makes mention of the summer and the winter trading expeditions that uh, that were established, that was established by Hashim. And you can imagine the, uh, the the leadership qualities that you have to have, the diplomacy to uh, to secure and build the infrastructure for these uh, these major uh, trading expeditions. Now. The summer caravan route uh, passed through the oasis settlement of Yathrib. Now, as many of you know, Yathrib was uh, is the, is the ancient name for the city of Medina. It became known after the Prophet's Hijrah as Medina to Rasul, and then it, it was called Medina for short. But during the pre-Islamic era, uh, it that city was known as Yathrib, and it was an agrarian uh, community, predominantly agricultural community, comprised of, uh, of Jewish and Arab uh, villages. And inshallah, in the, uh, the upcoming uh, episodes, we'll speak about the, uh, the religious uh, demographic of, uh, of Mecca and Medina and the Arabian Peninsula at large. So, so Hashim establishes uh, these trading routes, which essentially pull the people of Mecca and the people of Arabia uh, out of, uh, of poverty. Uh, he emerges as one of the most, uh, as the most wealthy man in Mecca. And because of his generosity, he took it upon himself to provide uh, food and drink uh, to the pilgrims. Now, historians mention that while Hashim was on a caravan trip to Syria, he stopped in Yathrib. Naturally, uh, the way to Syria from Mecca passes through uh, Yathrib. And in Yathrib, he proposes to a woman, to a lady by the name of Selma bint Amr, who was one of the most influential women from the Khazraj subclan of Najjar. Now, as, as many of you know, in Yathrib, and, and this is the case even after the Prophet's uh, migration, the two most powerful tribes in Yathrib are the Aus and uh, the Khazraj. So he marries Salma bint Amr, uh, who was one of the most influential women from the, the tribe of Khazraj. And Salma agreed to the marriage on the condition that any child of theirs would remain with her in Yathrib. She wanted to remain uh, with her relatives, with her family members in Yathrib. And she made it a condition that Hashem was not to take uh, any child of theirs uh, to, uh, to live in Mecca. So the couple, so Hashem and Selma, they were, uh, they were soon blessed with a baby boy that they named Sheba. And Sheba, incidentally, is the actual name of Abdul Muttalib. So, so Hashim is the great grandfather of the Prophet. Abdul Muttalib is the, the grandfather, grandfather of the Prophet, and his actual name was Sheba. And it is said that uh, he was named Sheba because he he was born with uh, white streaks in his hair. Now the word Sheba literally refers to the gray or the, the white hairs uh, on a person's head or beard. So if you know if an elderly man has a gray beard, we say this is a man who who is you know Sahib Sheba. You know he has Sheba on his on his head, meaning that he has white or gray hairs. So be, so because of those white or grayish streaks in his hair, uh, some say that he was given the name Sheba. Now, unfortunately, after the birth of Sheba, you know, several years after his birth, 
during a uh, a trading during a, a, a trading expedition to Gaza, Hashem actually dies. He dies uh, during one of these uh, trading uh, expeditions. He dies in Gaza, and uh, and his grave uh, is uh, is currently located in uh, in Gaza. Now, so Sheba. Uh, and his mother, they remain in Yathrib. And after the death of Hashem, now, so Hashem was the head of Quraysh. He was the chief of Quraysh. He was the most prominent person in Mecca. After his death, of course, Hashem had uh, three brothers who, uh, after him, who he, so he left behind three brothers, Abd Shams, who is the, the patriarch of the Umayyads, and we mentioned in our last episode that uh, that Abd Shams was deeply envious of his brother Hashim, and we mentioned that Abd Shams either had a son or an adopted son by the name of Umayyah, and from them you have the uh, the children of Umayyah known as Ben Umayyah. So Hashim has three brothers: Abd Shams, Nofel, who is a half brother. Of Hashem and, and Muttalib. Now, since the since Abd Shams and Nofel were busy merchants, the leadership of Mecca fell upon Muttalib. So after the death of Hashem, Muttalib rises to power. He is the chief of, of Quraysh, the chief of Mecca, and and naturally. Uh, especially during the pre-Islamic era, uh, custody laws were essentially governed by the most powerful. You know, so the the custody law was essentially the most powerful tribe takes custody. So Muttalib, uh, he uh, it mentions that that he actually goes to Yathrib to fetch his nephew and. It's possible that he had he had never uh, seen Sheba. So Muttalib goes to Yathrib, and uh, it's said that he sees a young boy, and he immediately uh, recognizes that this young boy is from our blood. You know, the Arabs were were experts at genealogy, and in many cases they were able to look at someone and tell if this person was was from Yathrib. Or from Mecca. So when Muttalib sees his nephew Sheba, he says that this boy is from us, and he actually takes Sheba uh, with him uh, to be raised in Mecca with his uncles. Now it's not mentioned what was the agreement with uh, with his mother, whether he was abducted, whether there was some type of agreement that was made. That's not clear. But what we know is that he definitely does come to Yathrib. And he fetches his nephew and he takes him with him. He takes his nephew with him back to Mecca. Now, the reason why Sheba is known as Abdul Muttalib, and Abdul Muttalib literally means the slave of Muttalib. So when he brought him to Mecca, uh, people saw that, you know, of course, you know, he was the uh, the chief of Quraysh. He was the most important person in Mecca, as, uh, you know, virtually the ruler of Mecca. When he comes back to Mecca and he has this 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 boy with him, people assume that it was you know perhaps a slave that he purchased. They didn't know that this was his nephew, and it seems that Muttalib joked that Sheba was a slave that he had bought from Yathrib, and from then on. Uh, Sheba became known as Abdul Muttalib. So essentially the joke stuck and that title, the slave of Muttalib, ends up replacing his actual name. So from then on, Sheba became known as Abdul Muttalib and the, essentially the name stuck. So that teaches you to be careful about the way about your jokes because you know they can actually end up replacing people's names. So when we look at the life of Abdul Muttalib, again, we, we, have, we have a decent amount of information on his life. Again, we don't have you know, vivid details, but we have some important events 
in the life of Abdul Muttalib, especially before the birth of the Prophet, that uh, definitely warrant some discussion. So there are three major events in the life of Abdul Muttalib before the birth of the Prophet uh, that I'd like to shed some light on. And uh, in this episode, we'll probably have time uh, to speak about two out of the three. So the first uh, major event in the life of Abdul Muttalib before the per before the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa is the rediscovery of, of the wells of Zamzam, and we'll speak about that in detail. Number two, the oath to sacrifice one of his sons, and number three, the invasion of Mecca by the army of Abraham. And, and this becomes known as Amul Fil, the year of the elephant, because Abraha actually invades Mecca with an army of elephants. And there's a whole story that involves uh, uh, the way that Abdul Muttalib protected the, uh, the holy sanctuary. So, beginning with uh, the rediscovery of Zamzam at the hands of Abdul Muttalib. Now, to appreciate uh, the rediscovery of the wells of Zamzam, uh, I think it's appropriate to speak a little bit about the history of the, the well of Zamzam itself. Now, Zamzam is a spring in Mecca, and, this, and the spring of Zamzam, as many of you know, first gushed forth during the time of Ismail and Hajar. The Quran mentions that uh, Prophet Ibrahim السلام, by the command of God places Hajar and Ismail uh, in Mecca. Uh, Surah 14 uh, verse 37 mentions the dua that Ibrahim makes. رَبَّنَا إِنِّي أَسْكَنْتُ مِنْ ذُرِّيَّةِ بِوَادٍ غَيْرِ ذِي زَرْعٍ عِنْدَ بَيْتِكَ الْمُحَرَّمِ Ibrahim himself mentions that I am placing a part of my progeny in a land that is devoid of vegetation. So he places them in Mecca. And we all know the story of, uh, of Hajar. Uh, Ismail is, is an infant. He's crying. And she, she runs between the hills of Safa and Marwa to, to fetch uh, water for, uh, for her son. And we know that uh, through a miracle, the, uh, the spring of Zamzam begins to flow at the feet of the child. Now, the tribe of Jurhum, uh, who, as we mentioned in our previous episode, they were pure Arabs from Yemen. Uh, they were known as Al Arab Al Ariba. And uh, they had passed through Becca. Now, of course, Becca was the ancient name for the city of Mecca. And they used to pass through this region long before Hajar and Ismail's arrival. So the tribe of Jurhum, they were familiar with this territory. But because there was no vegetation or water, they did not settle in the central. Uh, part of the Valley of Mecca. They settled in the surrounding areas. And later, with Hajar's permission, and so, so essentially Hajar and Ismail were the first permanent residents of Mecca after uh, it was discovered, after this, this, well, this, uh, this well and this spring sprang forth, uh, the tribe of Jurhum sought permission from Hajar to relocate to the central part of the Valley of Mecca. Now, unfortunately, when the tribe of Jurhum settled in the Valley of Mecca, uh, they, uh, they took on the role as the keepers of the Holy Sanctuary. And as time passed, unfortunately, they began to abuse their positions uh, as keepers of the the holy sanctuary, and naturally, when you have you know scarce resources, what generally happens, you know, you have people who are greedy, you have limited resources, you know, they started to abuse their power, they started to mistreat uh, the pilgrims, they started to take advantage of those who visited Mecca, 
And of course, this did not sit well with the Adnanian tribes. As we mentioned in our previous episode, the Adnanian tribes, they, are, they were the Arabized Arabs. They are from the direct line of, uh, of Ismail. And again, they, they opposed and they resisted the corruption of the Jurhum tribe. And with the help of the neighboring tribe of Banu Khuza'a, they were actually able to topple the, uh, the tribe of Jurhum. They chased them out of Mecca. So historians say that, you know, so the tribe of Jurhum ruled Mecca for nearly 2,000 years. So before relinquishing that power, before relinquishing nearly 2,000 years of Meccan rule, the, the tribe of Jurhum uh, destroyed the sanctuary. And they actually, you know, just to spite uh, those who defeated them, they buried the well of Zemzem. So they had the mindset that, you know, if we're not going to be in power, we're going to deprive you of all of the treasures of this land. And one of them being the well of Zemzem. So they buried the well of Zemzem. And this goes to show that the well uh, was only, only accessible to the keepers of the holy sanctuary. You know, those who controlled the well of Zemzem essentially controlled, uh, you know, the economy and they, uh, they had power. So they buried the well of Zemzem. Now, unfortunately, the, the tribe of Khuza'a did not bother searching for Zemzem because there were other wells that has that had sprung forth in the valley. And they were not, they had polytheistic inclinations, uh, you know, unlike uh, many of the direct descendants of Ismail who remained committed to the monotheistic tradition, uh, Benu Khuza'a had polytheistic tendencies. And in fact, their leader, Amr ibn Luhay, he actually travels to Syria. He, he purchases an idol by the name of Hubel and he imports it to Mecca and he establishes the idol of Hubel as the chief deity of Mecca. Now, aside from uh, the idol worship, the tribe of Khuza'a introduced a number of unusual religious practices that are actually explicitly mentioned in the Quran. Surah Al-An'am mentions many of these bizarre uh, practices that they had uh, established. You know, for instance, uh, the dedication of certain portions of food, drink, cattle, and crops to the idols and Allah. So they would make uh, certain offerings. Uh, they used to dedicate certain animals to the idols. And what that means is that if they dedicated a cow or a, a camel to the gods, the, that animal was not allowed to be used for domestic work. They also eliminated certain parts of the, the pilgrimage that were established by Ibrahim. So for instance, they omitted the standing on the plain of Arafah with the rest of the pilgrims. So they made various innovations. They, they innovated acts of worship, such as imposing uh, restricted diets upon uh, the pilgrimage, uh, upon the pilgrims during the pilgrimage. And they instituted this uh, custom of doing circuits around the Kaaba with little or no clothing. So you see that with the rise of, uh, of Banu Khuza'a after uh, vanquishing uh, the tribe of Jurhum, there was a decline. Uh, of the Abrahamic way. There was a deviation from uh, the Abrahamic way. Now in comes Abdul Muttalib. So thousands of years later, you have, uh, uh, not thousands of years, I would say, you know, maybe a thousand years later, several, several centuries later, you have Abdul Muttalib. So you can imagine that from the time, you know, for thousands of years really, the uh, the wells of Zemzem were unknown. People just didn't know where, where it was. You know, people had heard that there was a well 
called the Well of Zemzem, but because it was buried by the tribe, tribe of Jurhum, and then Benu Khuza'a made no attempt to find it, it was, it was a thing of the past. Now, Al Yaqubi, who, uh, who is a Muslim historian, he wrote an extensive uh, book on the history of Islam, and he's incidentally the first uh, Muslim geographer. In his book, uh, Tariq Al Yaqubi, he writes, Lemma takamala li Abdul Muttalib Majdu wa akarrat lahu Quraysh bil Fadl. You know, when Ab- Abdul Muttalib reached a high position of distinction in the eyes of Quraysh, he, he had a dream. Abdul Muttalib was sleeping uh, in the Hijr of Ismail. Now, the Hijr of Ismail is adjacent to the Kaaba itself. And many of us are familiar with that curved wall uh, near the Kaaba. He was sleeping in that area, which is uh, incidentally the the burial site of Ismail and Hajar. So he was sleeping there one evening and he sees a dream. So this figure says to Abdul Muttalib in the dream, Um ya abal bapha. Abdul Muttalib saw in a dream as he slept in Hijr Ismail that a figure approached him and said, Stand, O father of Mecca, and excavate Zamzam, the well of your great elder, meaning Ismail. So, Abdul Muttalib has this vivid dream uh, about Zamzam, and he receives instructions in the dream to excavate uh, the well. So Abdul Muttalib and his eldest son, Harith, they follow the instructions that were outlined in the dream, and they actually uncovered the well of Zamzam. Now, what did they find? They uncovered the treasures that had been buried, presumably by the tribe of Jurhum, going back thousands of years. Uh, The historical accounts mention that he was able to extract seven swords, seven shields, and two gold antelope sculptures. Now what Abdul Muttalib does, interestingly, is that he gave a fifth of the treasure as charity. And he used the metal to fashion doors to the Kaaba and use the gold uh, from the two gold antelope sculptures to gild the doors of the Kaaba. Now, there's there's an interesting uh, tradition that is reported by Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, salawatullahi alayhi, where he says, فيما أوصى به النبي صلى الله عليه وآله عليا عليه السلام. Imam al-Sadiq reported that the Prophet once said, O oh Ali, Abdul Muttalib founded five traditions during Jahiliyyah, during the pre-Islamic era that God has carried over into Islam. Meaning that Abdul Muttalib established five traditions that were endorsed by God and they were made a part of my sharia ya ali in abd al muttalib sanna fi al jahiliyyati khamsa sunan ajraha allah lahu fi al islam so what was what was the first so we have five traditions that were established by abd al muttalib that carried over into islam number 1 Abdul Muttalib forbade sons from marrying their stepmothers after their father's deaths. Now, during the pre Islamic era, of course, there was no limit on how many men, how many women a man could marry. In fact, women were considered to be the property of their husbands. 
And therefore, if a man died during the pre-Islamic era, his eldest son would inherit his property. And part of his estate, part of his property is his wives. So in the pre-Islamic era, sons would inherit their stepmothers and they would essentially uh, be their, their spouses or they would just you know, uh, have uh, conjugal relations with them. And it was Abdul Muttalib who forbade that practice. And you see that Allah, with the advent of Islam, Allah Azza wa Jal endorses, he endorses this prohibition uh, in the verse in the Quran where he says, do not marry the women whom your fathers had married. So that was number one. Number two, وَوَجَدَ كَنْزًا فَأَخْرَجَ مِنْهُ الْخُمْسِ وَتَصَدَّقَ بِهِ فَأَنْزَلَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ وَعَلَمْ وَأَنَّمَا غَنِمْتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَأَنَّ لِلَّهِ خُمُسَا He found it. Abdul Muttalib found a treasure. You know, when he, uh, when he was digging for the well of Zamzam, he found a treasure and he deducted a fifth of it as charity. After which God revealed, know that whatever you gain to God belongs a fifth. Now, so, so even in the Sunni tradition, you know, all Muslims believe in the concept of khums. The disagreement is about over what income, what items are liable for khums. Now, there is a consensus, there is a general consensus among both Sunni and Shia jurists that that. A treasure, if you discover a treasure, that is liable for khums. So this was something that was established, a practice that was established by Abdul Muttalib that was carried over uh, into Islam and was, was endorsed uh, by God. Number three. وَلَمَّا حَفَرَ زَمْزَمَا سَمَّاهَا سِقَايَةَ الْحَاجِ When Abdul Muttalib excavated Zamzam, he called it Siqayatul Hajj. He called it water for the pilgrims, meaning that he didn't claim it for himself. He designated the water of Zamzam for the Hujjaj. And Allah Azza wa Jal, he uses that same expression, Aj'altum Siqayatul Hajj. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala endorses this concept of the, the water of Zamzam being uh, designated for pilgrims. Number four. Number four. Imam al-Sadiq says, uh, reporting from the Prophet, so the Prophet says, وَسَنَّ فِي الْقَتْلِ مِئَةً مِنَ الْإِبْلِ فَأَجْرَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ ذَلِكَ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ Abdul Muttalib established that the retribution for murder, the blood money for murder, would be the value of a hundred camels after which God carried over the same ruling in Islam. So in the Hadith corpus, we have many narrations that speak about the uh, about blood money. And the, the value of the blood money that is to be given to the, uh, the, uh, the heirs of the victims was actually established by Abdul Muttalib and it was, uh, it was carried over into Islam as a part of the Sharia of the Prophet. And then finally, number five, Imam, uh, the Prophet says, وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لِلطَّوَافِ عَدَدٌ عِنْدَ قُرَيْشِ فَسَنَّ فِيهِمْ عَبْدُ الْمُطَّلِبِ سَبْعَةَ أَشْوَاطِ فَأَجْرَ اللَّهُ ذَلِكَ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ The Quraysh, number five, the Quraysh had no prescribed number of circuits for tawaf. People in the pre-Islamic era, they would perform circuits around the Kaaba, but there were no prescribed number. They would just do it as many times as they wanted, or they, they assigned arbitrary numbers. It was Abdul Muttalib who encouraged the that the that it be seven circuits, after which God carried over the same ruling in Islam. So if you want to perform tawaf around the Kaaba. You can't just do it once or twice or three times to complete a, a legally valid 
tawaf, it needs to be seven circuits. And this was an established, this was a practice that was established uh, by Abdul Muttalib and carried over into Islam. So you see that, you know, the position of Abdul Muttalib is so great that Allah Azza wa Jal endorses many of the practices of Abdul Muttalib and makes his practices a model and a template for, for Muslims to follow until the Day of Judgment. So it's very unfortunate that many Muslims today consider, you know, Abdul Muttalib to be, you know, uh, you know, a disbeliever. When in fact, you know, many of the rulings in Islam were actually inspired by the practices and the traditions of Abdul Muttalib. Sheikh al-Saduq uh, mentions in his book Al-Khisal, which is a, uh, a book uh, of hadith, it's a collection of hadith, uh, he reports a tradition from the Prophet where the Prophet says to Imam Ali. So you see that the Prophet used to actually share many of the merits of Abdul Muttalib with Ali ibn Abi Talib. You know, reminding him of, of their noble ancestors. So the Prophet says, Ya Ali, inna Abdul Muttalib kana la yastaqsim bil azlam. O Ali, Abdul Muttalib did not gamble. You know, if you look at, uh, especially the pre-Islamic era, the Arabs, you know, they, they had certain pastimes, certain hobbies. One of them was to gamble, and they enjoyed drinking, and, and they enjoyed warfare. But you see that Abdul Muttalib, despite the fact that gambling was so widespread, you see that he never succumbs to the social pressures. Abdul Muttalib was never the type of person to just follow and, and uh, follow the status quo. He was a man of principle. He was a man of integrity. Even if the whole of Arabia were gamblers, he was not a person who ever gambled. He never worshipped idols. Even though the vast majority of, uh, of Meccans were idol worshippers, he was committed to the monotheistic tradition of his forefathers. He never ate any food that was uh, dedicated to the idols. So he would never eat from the offerings of the gods. And he would proudly say, according to the Prophet, that I am upon the religion of my forefather, Ibrahim. al Yaqubi, again, who is a Sunni historian, and, and he was one of the, the scholars who challenged the traditional uh, view that Abdul Muttalib was a mushrik. Uh, al Yaqubi writes, Abdul Muttalib used to believe in one God. And he rejected the worship of idols. He founded certain traditions that the Messenger of God confirmed and the Quran corroborated. They are, so he gives a longer list of things that, that were uh, endorsed uh, by the Islamic tradition. They are that one must fulfill one's oaths, that an oath is something that you should take seriously. That, that if you make an oath between you and God, it's something that, uh, that, has, to be, uh, that has to be fulfilled. Number two, that the, and, and you'll see that inshallah in the, in the next uh, major event in his life. Number two, that the retribution for a life is 100 camels, like we mentioned. So in, in the pre-Islamic era, unfortunately, blood was very cheap. You know, you have these tribes who were locked in, in ceaseless warfare. So Abdul Muttalib establishes this, uh, this law of retribution, this, this um, practice of paying blood money to deter people from, from committing murder. Because giving, paying 100 camels is, is, is a huge amount of money. I mean, I, I imagine each 
each camel is being is equaling the value of a car. So by establishing this uh, this tradition of paying blood money, that was a very powerful deterrent to to prevent uh, uh, murder. Number three, uh, Al Yaqubi writes that one may not marry a mahram relative. So he he set some very strict laws about who you could marry and who you could not marry. Number four, that one must not enter other people's houses from the back door. That he established, uh, you know, basic akhlaq, that if you want to visit someone, don't go through the back door. You enter through the front door. You seek permission. Number five, that a robber's hand must be cut. And you see that this is uh, confirmed by the Quran. Number six, that burying one's daughter alive is forbidden. Abdul Muttalib was one of the most vocal people in the pre-Islamic era in opposing female infanticide. Number seven, the practice of mubahala. Abdul Muttalib, according to Al Yaqubi, he was the first one to do mubahala, and you see that the practice of mubahala was actually actually carried over into the Islamic tradition. That wine is forbidden. Number nine, that adultery is forbidden and punishable by law. Number 10, that matters may be decided by lots. Number 11, that no one may circuit the Kaaba naked. You know, when he became the chief of Quraysh, he, uh, he was very adamant about putting an end to this jahili practice. Number 12, that guests should be honored irrespective of their creed or, or their background. That just by virtue of being a guest, a person should be honored and treated with respect. Number 13, that a pilgrim must only pay for his pilgrimage with lawfully gotten money. That you cannot use unlawful, usurped money to perform hajj. Your money needs to be clean. Number 14, that the sacred months must be honored. The months of, of Rajab, Dil Qa'da, Dil Hijjah, and Muharram are months that should be honored and there should be no fighting or bloodshed uh, in those sacred months. And that prostitutes be banished from the, uh, the holy sanctuary of, of Mecca. That if people want to to, to practice, they, if people want to sell themselves in that way, they're not permitted to, uh, to solicit uh, sex in, uh, in the sacred valley of Mecca. And therefore, because of his nobility, even in the pre-Islamic era, you see that the Quraysh used to say that Abdul Muttalib is the second Ibrahim. You can imagine, you know, who Abdul Muttalib was for the the mushrikeen of Quraysh to call him the second Ibrahim. And this is something that he has in common with the Holy Prophet So the mushrikeen, the Meccans, the Quraysh gave Abdul Muttalib the honorary title of being the second Ibrahim because of his, his noble character. And they also give his grandson, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, the titles of as al Amin because of because of his noble character, because of his uh, his uh, his morality, and therefore you find uh, in Al Kafi Sheikh Al Kulaini mentions a beautiful riwaya, beautiful tradition from Imam Al Sadiq where he says, you know, just to give you an idea of the lofty station of Abdul Muttalib on the Day of Judgment. He says, يُحْشَرُ عَبْدُ الْمُطَّلِبِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا Abdul Muttalib will be raised on the day of resurrection as a nation unto himself. He was a single man, but he had the influence of an, an entire nation on human civilization and on the Islamic tradition. عَلَيْهِ سِيمَاءُ الْأَنْبِيَاءُ وَهِيبَةُ الْمُلُوكِ on the day of judgment, he will have the mark of the prophets and the heir of kings, meaning that he will be a person who is who will will you, you will be awestruck when you look at him because he has the mark of the prophets and the heir 
of kings. So you see, even Imam Sadiq emphasizes the great spiritual status of Abdul Muttalib. In fact, all Muslims are indebted to this, uh, this great personality, the honorable grandfather of our Holy Prophet. So that is uh, the first major event in the life of Abdul Muttalib before the birth of the Prophet, the rediscovery of the well of Zamzam. Now, very briefly, the second major event in the life of Abdul Muttalib before the birth of the Prophet is his oath to sacrifice one of his sons. Now, as you can imagine, when Abdul Muttalib rediscovers the well of Zamzam, naturally he becomes the keeper of the sanctuary. And of course, being controlling the well of Zamzam, uh, you know, gives a person a lot of prestige and power. And you can imagine that there was jealousy, there was tension. So Abdul Muttalib prayed to Allah that, that God strengthen him by giving him sons. Because, because your strength was proportionate to, you know, the number of family members that you have. You know, naturally, when you have a tribal culture, your protection comes from your clan. And the bigger your family, the stronger you are. So, Abdul Muttalib, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses him with uh, nine sons. So, so, the narration, and this is a narration from Imam al-Baqir, and I'll just read the, uh, the English translation for the sake of time. Imam al-Baqir, alayhi salam, our fifth imam, he says... Abdul Muttalib had nine sons, so he vowed to sacrifice one if God were to grant him a tenth. He wanted to have ten sons. And the reason, presumably, you know, the reason why he makes a vow to sacrifice is because, you know, he probably had heard that Ibrahim alayhi uh, salam tried to sacrifice Ismail. So this concept of sacrificing as uh, as a way of expressing your gratitude towards God was was in the minds of people at that time. So Abdul Muttalib had nine sons. So he vowed to sacrifice one if God were to grant him a tenth. When Abdullah was born, he could not muster the strength to kill him since the messenger of God was in his loins. Now, it seems from this narration that through inspiration or through some type of divine revelation, Abdul Muttalib knew that his youngest son would be the father of the final messenger of God. So he was very reluctant. So he, when he makes this vow, he was very reluctant to, uh, to sacrifice his youngest son. So he brought 10, 10 of his camels and drew lots between them and Abdullah. But Abdullah's lot was drawn. So he added 10 camels and he drew lots again. But Abdullah's lot kept being drawn. His name kept on coming up in the draw. So Abdul Muttalib kept adding 10 more camels. When the number of camels reached a hundred, now you can imagine that this happened, you know, uh, ten times in a row, nine times in a row. When the number of camels reached a hundred camels, the camel's lot was drawn. But Abdul Muttalib said guiltily, "I have not been fair with my lord." He says, "Ma ansaftu rabbi." He felt bad. He felt that he was kind of cheating his way out of the uh, the sacrifice so he repeats he repeats it two times more so he drew lots again twice more and both times the camel's lot was drawn so he said now i know that now i know that my lord is satisfied so he slaughtered the camels so this is a narration from Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. We have a narration where someone asks Imam al-Rida alayhi salam, or eighth Imam, 
you know, what did the Prophet mean when he used to say, I am the son, because we have a statement from the Prophet where he says, I am the son of the two who were nearly slaughtered. Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam, he says, يُعْنَى إِسْمَعِيلِ بْنِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ الْخَلِيلِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ وَعَبْدُ اللَّهِ إِبْنُ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ Imam Radha says what the Prophet meant was that he is the son of Ismail who was nearly slaughtered and he is the son of Abdullah, his father, who was nearly slaughtered by his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. And then the Imam speaks about the uh, how Ismail was nearly sacrificed and his sacrifice was uh, replaced with the sacrifice of a ram. And then the Imam says, and for the second, meaning as for Abdul, Abdullah being nearly slaughtered, Abdul Muttalib had once clung to the ring on the door to the Kaaba and begged God to grant him 10 sons. And he vowed that he would sacrifice one of them whenever God answered his prayer. So he, here Imam al Rida is giving us the beginning of the story. Imam al Rida, Imam al-Baqir in the earlier tradition mentioned that when he had nine sons, he, he, he prayed to God once again to give him 10 and then he would make the sacrifice. So God granted him. So he makes, he begs God to grant him 10 sons and he vowed that he would sacrifice one of them whenever God answered his prayer. When their number reached 10, he said, Abdul Muttalib said, God has fulfilled his part, so by God I shall fulfill mine. He took his, his oath to God very seriously. So he gathered his sons in the Kaaba and drew lots between them. And he drew the lot of Abdullah, the father of the messenger of God, who was his favorite son. So he draws a lot to determine which son it's going to be. It ends up being Abdullah. He drew a second and third time, but each time the lot of Abdullah would be drawn. So Abdul Muttalib took and bound him and prepared to slaughter him in the same way that Ibrahim did with Ismail. But Quraysh came together to prevent him and his daughter, Abdul Muttalib's daughter, Atika, she said to him that take those free range camels of yours that roam the sanctuary and draw lots between them and your son and give your Lord until he is satisfied. So he takes, he follows the suggestion of Atika and then he draws lots between his uh, his, uh, his son and the free range camels and then he ends up slaughtering 100 camels to save the life of Abdullah and this is why the Prophet ﷺ used to proudly say I am the son of the two who were nearly slaughtered inshallah in our next episode we'll speak about the third most important event in the life of Abdul Muttalib, which is the invasion of Mecca by the army of Abraha. With that, uh, uh, I look forward to, uh, to continuing this conversation in our next episode. Thank you for tuning in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Ajjal farajahum. Any questions or comments? Sheikh, could you could you describe this practice of drawing lots? And in this specific story, was it like a one to one chance of the all the hundred camels being drawn versus uh, Abdullah's lot? So it's, I mean, it seems that yes, the, the lots. I mean, initially the lots were between between him and his other brother. So you have ten lots. Let's call them ten sticks. And each stick would have uh, the name of one of the sons. And so initially, Abdul Muttalib draws lots to determine which son to sacrifice. And we know that Abdullah, the youngest, the, the, his most beloved son, uh, his name was drawn. And Abdul Muttalib you know, does it two or three more times, but 
the name of Abdullah uh, is drawn. And, uh, and because he, he recognizes that, you know, this is the man, you know, presumably through a type of inspiration, you know, based on the hadith that we mentioned with Imam al-Baqir, that he knew that this would be the father of the final messenger of God. So he knows that he can't slaughter him, but he also knows that he has to fulfill, he has to fulfill a sacrifice. So uh, he then draws lots between him and the free range camels. So uh, it seems that, uh, that, uh, that it, it would be, a, you know, either a 50, 50 draw or for each, uh, for each, uh, yeah, it seems that it would have to be just drawing between him and, uh, and the camels. And it doesn't really go into detail about how exactly the lots were uh, were drawn, but uh, but it it's I mean, it, it just goes to show you that the number reached a hundred, and it seems that you know Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, because again God is the ultimate manager of all of these affairs, you know by by making the life of of uh, of Abdullah. Uh, uh, at basically, for the fact that a hundred camels had to be slaughtered to sacrifice the life of Abdullah is an indication of of how valuable uh, he is. That this is this is not this is a ni'mah that in order to preserve it, you have to give a lot of your dunya away for the sake of God. I mean, a hundred camels is literally the equivalent of giving away a hundred, you know, uh, you know. You know Bentleys, if you want to look at it that way, or Mercedes. So it's it's really because I mean, if you think about it, camels were a very prestigious form of transportation. So it's it's like giving away a hundred luxury cars. So this really is is most likely meant to highlight uh, the value of uh, of the life of this young boy, uh, especially considering that he's the father of the final messenger of God. It was also interesting that 100 camels is what is established as the blood money um, yeah. by Abdul Muttalib. Is there any indication that this might be a causal thing? I don't know. I, I, I can't say with certainty uh, if it's related to this story. Um, the Ahadith just mentioned that this was the, uh, the, the blood money that was, uh, that was dictated to be paid to, uh, to the victims if, if a murder were to take place, if a life were lost. Yeah, I, I haven't seen anything that, that connects that ruling uh, <clears throat> to this oath to uh, sacrifice. And could you explain why uh, Ab Abdul Muttalib was considered, like was since he, when he already had nine sons and he wanted 10, wouldn't sacrificing a son afterwards just mean he still ends up with nine sons? So why why would this oath be made in the first place? I mean, when, when you when you say when he says that I want ten sons and I will sacrifice one of them, he he still benefits from having a child, you know, uh, because presumably the sacrifice is not going to be made when they're toddlers, it's going to be, it's going to be when they come of age. And this is what we see in the Quran, you know, when, when Ismail was of the age where he was able to join his father in his work, he was able to accompany him. So he reached the age of physical maturity. So uh, yes, you would end up obviously with nine sons, but you would still, uh, you would still have a son uh, for, for at least uh, a decade. So, but what's the benefit of having uh, uh, a son for such a short period of time? You know, this is a, a sacrifice that, that he was willing to make to express, uh, to really demonstrate to Allah that I'm willing to give up what is most dear to me for the sake of your pleasure. Now, I know it's very difficult for us to even wrap our minds around this. Now, of course, you and I, we can't, we can't make uh, such a nether, but you know, people like Ibrahim and, uh, and Abdul Muttalib, you know, because these are people who are either prophets or they're connected to revelation. You know, they, they know what their responsibility is. They know what is expected of them. So, so, so the, the lesson of this, 
of this story is not to say, you know, oh, Allah, give me four sons. And, you know, if you give me four, I'll, I'll take one of them, you know, uh, and I'll fly them out of the U.S. and I'll slaughter them out of, you know, to express my, my gratitude for you. Now, of course, this is not something that's meant to be practiced by us. This is something that was practiced by certain individuals uh, who were appointed by God under certain circumstances. And uh, I think you've kind of already done this, but just there's just a question to clarify what, what is meant by sacrifice. So sacrifice is to, uh, to, to take the life of, uh, of the son in the same way that this was, this, this was what Ibrahim was trying to do. And this was a, a test. And then, of course, at the last moment, uh, when he showed that he would have gone forward with it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, uh, he he <clears throat> substitutes that uh, Ismail with with a ram. So the sacrifice literally means the taking of the life. Uh, thank you. And some of the traditions that were established by Abdul Muttalib seem like things that were still around during the time of the Prophet. Did those practices creep back in to gener generations later, or were they never fully eradicated? Uh, which. You mean like the you know the banning of wine and and other things like that? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just like just like with anything, I mean, you might you might have a government that says marijuana is illegal, but that doesn't mean that people are going to stop smoking marijuana. You know, because he was the chief of Quraysh and he had the authority to introduce laws. The official law was that it's forbidden to drink, but of course, you know, people are free and uh, and just like we see even in secular governments today, just because there's a law, it doesn't mean that people are gonna follow the law. But he is credited for, you know, at least reintroducing this uh, this divine law, the, the prohibition of, of wine and, and fornication and, and so on and so forth. All right, thank you. And, and is it known what kind of injustices the tribe of Jurhamites would commit against others? I mean, we don't know. It doesn't specifically mention, but you can imagine that perhaps one of the things that they would do is that they, they would collect a tax from people who would come to perform the pilgrimage. They would, you know, they would impose a lot of financial burdens on them. Maybe they even confiscated their property. I mean, I, I would imagine that a lot of it had to do with financial corruption. It could be even be that uh, they... Uh, you know, they, maybe they took advantage of, of women who were performing the pilgrimage. Maybe we're talking about, you know, raping female pilgrims who would, who would visit Mecca, looting them. So it, I mean, again, these are, this is all speculation, but when you talk about corruption in, in that time, I mean, these are some of the things that would come to mind. Yeah. It's one, there's one question. Um, was this kind of nazar made by the father of Maryam bint Imran? I think this is about. Um, I sense. Like so, so, so the uh, the nether that was made by by the wife of uh, the nether was made by the mother of Maryam. Inni nether tuma fi batni muharrara that I am dedicating uh, to you what is in my womb. Now this. This nether is not the nether to slaughter, but rather it's it's a nether because at that moment she didn't know that it was a female. Uh, she knew that this this the child that is growing in my womb, my husband Imran received revelation that from his line there will be a prophet who who uh, who cures the blind and the leprous and he will perform miracles. So she dedicates this child to the temple, meaning that to dedicate a child to the temple is to essentially relinquish your right as the parent. And basically you, they serve in the temple. They, they worship and they serve the, the rabbis and the priests. So this is a different type of, uh, of nether. It's a nether of dedicating the child to the service of a temple. Whereas the nether of, of Abdul Muttalib was to actually slaughter uh, one of his uh, children, one of his sons. 
Thank you very much, Sheikh. Ahsantum, Jazakum Allah. Thank you for, for listening. And uh, and hopefully I would say another one or two episodes and we'll begin with uh, the birth of the Prophet. And, and I, I just think it's important for us to kind of set the stage and, and give context uh, to uh, to the region and the people uh, before we actually uh, begin with the, the, the story of the Prophet. So just bear with me with, with some of this background information, but I promise that it will... It will make the rest of the story a lot more easy to understand.